for GM. Great, right? This is all standard. Biasing, favorites here. And all of this stuff. Okay, so let's say we just have this wire, right? This just looks like a buffer. And this just looks like some LRC network, right? Now, when we connect this, right, we have a few things going on. We have our main network, which is this transistor amplifier structure. We're going to take some of the output and feed it back through this network. This network is going to kind of process it down this way and up this way. And it's going to have some resulting change over here that gets fed back to our input. So call this our oscillator, our feedback network. Okay, all of this stuff here. Uh, let's just turn color, but okay. <laughs> it's our feedback network. What happened? Okay, feedback network. And our main amplifier here. Okay. So if we draw this in a block diagram, it kind of looks like this. Alright, we have our amplifier, right? Because AV, voltage gain. Feeds back to a network called beta, which is our feedback network, which is what generates our frequency, our oscillator. Feeds it back, and we call that VF, the output of this, and V out's over here. Um, so for those of you who have not done 141, if we want this to be over time to be stable and or to grow, we have to meet certain criteria. So this just means A times B, our like open loop gain, has to be greater than one, greater than or equal to one. Because let's say this is like one half, right? So signal, let's say we put a signal initially here. Um, let's say it's like two volts, right? And then um, we do one full cycle. If, if it's like one half, we'll have one volt here. And then half again, one half, one fourth. We can go down to zero. So that's not stable. After you know, several cycles, we're going to have pretty much no output here, right? That's useless. So we want this to be, this loop gain to be greater than or equal to one. If it's equal to one, we're just going to have a stable oscillation. Right? We'll have something that looks like this. And if it's greater than one, we're gonna have something that looks like this. Right? It's gonna grow. Real, real life can't really have this ever, right? We can't have infinite energy. But we're gonna, what we're gonna do is gonna make it equal to one. Right? So that's the criteria we're gonna try to meet. And that criteria will give us those equations. Second thing, it's more nuanced that we don't really, I mean, we do care about, but it's not something that we don't understand per se, but a phase shift of zero degrees at omega naught. For those of you who have done 141, if you look at like Foley plot, a scary word. Um, we have let's look at this. All right, um, with the low pass filter, for example, um, our phase is going to go from zero to 90 degrees. It looks like this. All right. Um, so what happens is, at some point for like an LR for a second order system um, like this, we don't want to uh, at our resonant frequency. Let's say at this frequency here, it's like some arbitrary point, right? We don't want our phase to be 180 degrees because then when we take our output like over here at this frequency, let's call this omega f. At omega f, we have some input. Let's say one volt input at omega f. If our output's 180 degrees, our phase probably here is 90, but like let's say it was 180. So let's say like second order low pass, for example. And there are some holes in that as well, second order low pass. But second order low pass will give us 180, 180 degrees. At omega f, if our phase is negative 180 degrees, and we have uh, any amplitude here, right? Let's say one volt. This is going to be negative one volt, right? Because this is going to flip it from here. And this feedback network is just going to multiply by another negative, right? So it's negative times negative one, we have one volt here. It's going to like just amplify. Um, typically speaking, we don't want this to happen at any other frequency because then if we design for omega naught and this other frequency omega f where this holds, omega f will also oscillate and then we have two oscillations and less bad. So we only want one frequency for this to occur, so we want this to happen at only a mega knot, not some other frequency, mega f. So that's just the idea behind that, this second more nuanced rule. Um, if you do like 115b, you'll learn more about like whole zero compensation, where you'll talk more about that, but for rap, not really important. So back 
to the more math side of things. Go over there. I'll keep this up. So, first things first, this makes sense, right? Beta is Vf over V0. The reason being, Vf is the output of, of, the, of the oscillator, the, the beta network, and V0 is the input. So, beta is like, if you think of it like a gain, right? Beta, your gain is going to be equal to your output over your input, right? And I guess for clarity's sake, make this V0 as well, right? So, we see, you see how we get beta is Vf over V0, right? It's a standard um, 141 approach. Next thing I want to draw out here is our network from the perspective of V0 and Vf. a little weird, um, but what's kind of happening here is if we look at our V naught, right, this is drawing my V naught right over here, right? We just look at our V naught, we look this way, we want to see this C2 to ground, which is that first negative J X2, going this way, and then if we look up, we're going to see this negative J X1, and this negative J X1 is going to feed into our, uh, this node here, and at this node we're going to have our um, our VF, right? This is our VF. And looking the other way, we're going to have the L and RS. So that's why that's going down to ground. Any questions on that? That's kind of a tricky diagram, but if you can follow that, then you'll be good to go. Any questions? So, now we have our simplified diagram here. Um, what we're going to do is and make a few assumptions here, right? This is our general circuit. Again, we want to consider the concept of resonance. And at resonance, we know a few things we will hold, right? Should not be a negative, that might be like a hyphen. Um, Makes sense, right? At resonance, we expect all of these reactances to cancel each other out. So ZL plus ZC1 plus ZC2 equals zero. That cancels up to the other side. And then the uh, conductor reactance is equal to the sum of the capacitive reactants. Capacitive reactances, right? Everyone gonna follow that? Okay, cool. Next step is this is one equation here. Okay. So now, what we do, go back over here, and we do, it's effectively like a voltage divider here, okay? So, I'm going to get, I'm just gonna write this out first. We get this. So it's pretty much saying is if we have some current here, arbitrary current. This voltage drop Vf is going to be that current times Jxl plus Rs, right? How we get like that top. And then at the bottom here, it's that same current because they're open, right? Um, but that, that same current in relation to V0, which is now going to be the same current here, going this way, right? And now from V0 all the way down to ground, we see the same current, but Jxl plus Rs minus this one here. Everyone kind of follow that? I'll rewrite this here as well. Is that, that better? Or can you, can you all see? Okay. So, 
How do we get that equation? Everyone follow that? Okay. It's it's like a weird voltage divider. Okay. So now we're going to combine this equation with this one at resonance, right? Now we get that beta is going to be equal to. Okay. So now we can just say this is equal to um, this. I think that would fit, yeah. So remember our criteria from before, A times B has to be greater than or equal to 1. So we solve for B, all right? B has to be greater than 1 here, all right? Um, C1 plus C2 is also going to be always greater than 1. So it's going to be greater than or equal to 1. This is great. It satisfies half of that. So now all we need to prove is that A is greater than 1, right? A, B. So now, look at A, B here. <coughs> We just disconnect this, all right? Can someone tell me, I guess, what A, V? Well, disconnect it here. Can someone tell me how we can calculate A, V, or like a step in the right direction towards it? I'll give you a hint. This looks like a common collector, and we talked about an equation for the game of a common collector. So it makes sense we can use that same equation here, right, to figure out this AV, right? So that's exactly what we're going to do. So AV is equal to the emitter impedance over G, 1 over GM plus the emitter impedance. Alright, so we get this equation. And the emitter impedance is just looking down this way, so you'll see this RE in parallel with that equivalent network there, which we didn't necessarily solve for, but we could solve for. Okay, so we're going to solve for that now. Um, go back over here. Can I erase all of this stuff? <coughs> One thing to double check yeah. is the denominator for that supposed to be C2 or C1? Um, because doing, I think I. I think doing the work, I think I used yeah, the C1. I saw that, yes, I was a little confused. Um, might be C1. I'll go back and double check. I'll, I'll do it after. But either way, we have C1 and C2 be the same value. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't change anything, but I'll double check that after. Okay, so apart from that, I can erase it, right? Mm -hmm. I'll keep this here as a reminder to go back and do it. Okay, now we're going to calculate a CE. So, what's it look like going this way? The same approach we've done before. If this is our V out, um, we have this RE go to ground, right? And then I said we'll have something in parallel with that, right? Looking into the uh, oscillator. We're going to see that CT go to ground. We're going to see C1. Okay. 
You'll see this. Okay. And I'm just going to solve for ZE here. Write down some equations. Resonance XL equals X1 plus X2, so we just get X2, XL equals X1 plus X2, so this just goes away. So that's not RS. So now, let's get to this equal to X2 squared minus JX2 RS for RS, which is approximately X2 squared over RS. writing big enough like in all the see from back there. So now that's our Z E. Plug that in over here. G M squared of R S. Get this equation here for A B. Solve for this, say a b is greater than 1. So if we plug in the b value from before, which is x1 plus x2. Um, we can then solve. But the important part now is we know this is going to, um, we have to solve for this. So if we do multiplication with that, that b, which is going to be x1 plus x2 over x2, if we do a times b. <laughs> greater than or equal to 1, we'll take the simple oscillation case where that requires it to just be equal to 1, and then we'll get that gm is going to be equal to like not squared c1 c2 rs. It's the same result as over there. Okay. Pretty cool. Um, you know, there were still a few underlying assumptions here, right, that um, we made over there, rs being small. Um, at resonance, which always holds. But R being small is an assumption. This gain equation we use as itself an approximation. But it gives us a good GM value, matches up with the long complicated math. Any questions on this? Okay. This is the first time that this has been done, but I'm gonna go one step further and talk about the new oscillator we're using for wrap. So this whole time, what we do is we take an inductor and we have some capacitances. We wind the inductor ourselves and we're like, okay, we get oscillation now. Uh, this worked last year, but it wasn't very stable. Um, you know, because we make the inductors ourselves, they're very susceptible to. If we touch it, it'll you know, change their inductance. As we move things around, they'll change. Just sitting around in the ambient room, you know, temperature changes. This is it up quite a bit. Um, you know, at least if we want to make like a 22 megahertz oscillator. We ideally, if it's like 22.00015 megahertz, right? This is like maybe be acceptable, right? This is still changing by quite a bit. Like really, this is as far as hertz go, right? It's still changing by what's that like? 150. 1.5 thousand? 1.5k? Things up like that. That still changes quite a bit, right? This is assuming it stays at 22.00015. All right, we would see it maybe go 22.001, uh, or you know, 22.00001, you know? It fluctuate quite a bit. It wouldn't go up to like here, maybe, you know? Still here, but that's still quite a bit. Especially when in communication, you know, when we have a receiver, and we're like, hey, we're gonna transmit at X frequency. 
So the receiver has, okay, well, we're going to do 27 megahertz. But in reality, we're getting it like 26.9. We're going to sample it assuming it's 27, but we're actually not at 27. The receiver doesn't know better. It's hardware. It's not smart. You know? So what do we do? So we want to be as accurate as possible across temperature, and we also just want to be precise. So this year, we're using what we call a crystal oscillator. You can think of it like a tuning fork. You hit it, and it will only resonate at one exact frequency, and it's very stable. Um, another way you can think about it is, if you know what quality factor, this, this inductor and those capacitors have a very low quality factor. For example, with um, you know the inductors we have, we'd be lucky if we get like quality factor of 30, 40 at these frequencies. And um, we can't use SMD comp uh, components because they have less quality factor. So we want high quality factor components that allow us to have as stable a frequency generated as possible. So we go to a crystal oscillator, very precise, very high quality factor in the thousands, which is really huge. So that's what we're going to use. And it doesn't change too much compared to uh, the current setup we have. It looks quite different, but we can simplify so it looks the same, more or less. Again, we're going to make a few assumptions. As you'll find out, all of the electronics is about making assumptions. It doesn't ever change. Okay. So first things first, let's talk about okay, what's the crystal look like. So this is what we call a crystal oscillator. It's just a two, uh, two terminal device. And we can make an equivalent circuit for it, which will look something like this. good things here for this equivalent circuit. You know, we cover this up, we just see an LRC circuit, right? So we expect that, but it's an oscillator. Um, the CP arises from various, um, I guess, material related problems to the crystal. Um, just, you know, in manufacturing the actual crystal structure itself, that's how the CP arises. So, okay, what are we gonna do now? Where could we shove this, this crystal, right? Because the thing is, this crystal, we need to give it energy somehow. <coughs> it doesn't just come with this capacitor fully charged. You know, We've got to kickstart it somehow. Just like this LRC circuit, we have to kickstart it, right? So, you know, it kind of makes sense if we can just hook it up right here, right? We can just hook it up here. That's like the same problem we had before. Right? More or less the same problem. We'll make a few assumptions here. First off, let's ignore the CP. Doesn't affect our model too much, right? That's the biggest assumption we make there, at least the most useful one. So now we're just left with this, right? We can apply the same 141 approach. Um, so you'll see that your beta ends up being the the same, you can do the same approach for it because that circuit over there will look now like this. circuit on the left now looks like this. We're ignoring the, ignoring the CP, so that's gone. And uh, again, you can go through and say, at resonance, I'll just make a shortcut here. Let's say XL is going to be equal to the sum of these capacitances. Now we get that 
theta We can apply this, so we just get R plus um, x1 plus x2, yeah, all over R plus infinity x2. Same approximation as before, as soon as R is small, we get x1 plus x2 over x2. The beta is the same. Um, now, if we were to do our gain, Go back. I'll go back over there. I'll just rewrite this into the capacitor. We do the same math we did for ZE like we did before. We'll get. We get the same ZE as well, right? So beta is the same, ZE is the same. I erase it, but the beta times AB being equal to one. You can solve that the same because it's the same equation, and you'll still end up with this. So overall, it's the same thing. We just have a different element there, but you know, we make some approximations, and we can still design our system to do the same thing. So this equation still holds for a crystal oscillator, even though. You know, if the logs look like this, we still end up ignoring this RS at some point, and then the CP we covered at the start. Any questions on that? Okay, um, let's see. So module three will have you, like I said at the start, we'll be doing a buffer. You'll have to buy it first, figure out what your gain should be, how your current, etc. Then, in for output impedance, you have to modify R1 and R2 to make sure you get the right values. Um, you'll notice for the output impedance, I believe you want it to get around 50. You can end up being your input correct, your gain correct, and your output will be weird if your R1 and R2 are not large enough, sorry, not small enough. Because what happens is when you look through the, uh, the emitter, you typically won't see the R1 and R2. You know, your small signal model looks like this. use R pi, R1 parallel R2, right? This is graphic, it's common emitter. Oh, wait, sorry, oops. Yeah, common, this is common collector. Um, right, but you'll see um, 